Hello, welcome to another Tonal Landscape oil painting demonstration. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy, and welcome as well to day 12, or week 12 if you prefer, of the Mastering George Ines series. The George Ines painting I did a study after today is called, well the title I had initially is Sunshine and Clouds, but I've discovered the uh, the full title would be seen on the Pennsylvania Railroad. He did it in 1883. Um, the size of it was 27 and a half by 41 and a half, a heck of a lot bigger than my little eight by 12. And we'll talk about some of my challenges with this painting in a second. Um, in fact, uh, we'll talk about that next. Uh, we've given you the sort of a quick overview. <coughs> well, let's talk about this. This image is incredibly difficult to find online. I can't find it again. Um, I did find it, and I had a very low-res um, version of it, which I um, had to expand quite a bit uh, using Gigapixel. Um, and there's a threshold of what you can do there. You're, it's using AI to make things up, um, and it's better than having 100% low-res, but um, I was super attracted to the clouds, as I'm sure you've noticed, they're pretty cool, just in my little um, attempt at, um, you know, uh, making a study after this uh, painting. Um, the one thing I want to call out is that you'll hear me read the description from the uh, his catalog, um, Resonate, um, in one moment, but um, you see that little path on our right, and then you see this shape there. I had no idea what that is. I basically just had to paint it. And I'm going to take a lesson from this. I should have looked it up uh, on the live video, which you can access in the members area. It's about <laughs> four hours long. <laughs> but full of good tips, full of good information. You can always put one of those on while you're doing your own work. And uh, every now and again, you hear, what, he, what, what did he say? You know. Anyway. Uh, I digress uh, as usual. Um, I basically uh, yeah, just had to copy what was there and um, I read in the description though which you know that uh, that Arthur would have had maybe access to a nice color photo of this at the full resolution. Um, on that path is a, is a dude in a hay wagon and um, I just it doesn't look that bad um, considering I had no idea what it was I thought maybe it was some anomaly in the road or or didn't know but when in doubt I just copy what's there as best as I can um, a lot of vagueness in this painting now the thing is and I want to always caution you on any of these in studies uh, everything I'm doing is digital um, oftentimes people will manipulate, well, actually even you take a photo with one type of film in a film camera you're going to get one type of color a different type of film, a different color. Um, these images will look different on every monitor. Uh, uh, they would print different on every printer, so on and so forth. So I have to sort of plug myself into um, what I think George was after. Um, the challenge in this painting was that there was no strong contrast. So um, I held really far back. I didn't barely use any black at all. Anyway, let's dip into the book. So we got a little time to read from the history of American tonalism, a little biographical information about George as well. So that's enough burbling for me. I'm going to give you the description. Uh, in the right foreground, a man walks along a raised road. Hmm, interesting, yes. Ahead of an approaching hay wagon, passing an area at the center where a brook flows across the foreground between a rocky outcropping on the near side and a steep bank along its far side. In the middle distance there are clumps of trees left and right. On the near side of the broad flat fields that stretch towards the distance at the far right a plume of smoke rises from the smokestack of a locomotive. I had no idea what that was. I just painted a little black bit and some smoke. Interesting though. Uh, traveling through the hollow. Now you would have seen this at 40 something inches, okay? Um, all across the distance stretches a city or uh, or connected towns with commercial buildings on the left. Um, in my case, it's just a few dits and uh, dots and things like that. Because uh, there's a certain resolution at 8 by 12, you're duplicating a painting that's this large, uh, especially without a super high res photo. It would be impossible for me to detect all that. The upper sky is full of clouds, and sunlight breaks through at the center as dark clouds on the left depart 
the light falls on the middle ground in the distance and the, to me this is a cloud painting straight up and it was pretty challenging painting these clouds I have to say um, it's very kind of specific shapes and there's a balance that has to be struck be, be, uh, between being super tight um, and which he wasn't in his painting um, and then or just being so loose that it barely resembles what he did so I'm always striking a balance there and getting back to the color thing I do my best approximation on the color but um, if you've seen this painting in real life for example I believe it's in a private collection but uh, you could go whoa he got that so wrong doesn't he know yeah no I don't I'm just guessing um, let's read a bit from the comment here. This apparently is a very distant westward view towards part of Newark and what was then Bloomfield and just a bit of Montclair. The flat meadowlands Inez often was to paint in this final decade. This landscape is generally similar to a shortcut to Wachtung Station, New Jersey, which is also 1883. I look at that. That was like a zoom in of, of a part of this painting. In mating the view, in that both paintings have a dark soft foreground, at a lower level a train animating the view and a level landscape that moves rapidly into the distance, and the town across the background, this painting is considerably more daring, formally and just having one narrow band of definite form at the horizon, the general appearance of the flat landscape in the large sky, a point of chief interest recalls some 17th century Dutch landscapes. But the concentration of information at the horizon can be found in the work of a number of Inessa's contemporaries. Thinly, broadly, and apparently quickly painted, the landscape has... It, yeah, thinly is right. I'm going to take a break and talk about that. Uh, so thinly that I was thinking, is this a watercolor? Because I was, you know, struggling at some point to get... The, the, the feeling uh, that was in the painting and that explains it was very thinly painted mm. uh, I, and, and in some cases in the bottom especially I painted much thinner than I usually do uh, and I had some decent success and uh, maybe I would have if I had gone a little thinner at the sky too we, we don't know I'm happy with the painting that's all I gotta say thinly broadly and apparently quickly painted the landscape has the unity and sweep of an inspired moment of painting the thinness of the rapid paint application over almost the entire surface allows one to clearly see that this is not the landscape of this general appearance that Ines painted over a finished and already sold seascape according to the account of George Ines Jr. in uh, his biography of his dad the shapes have a soft, semi-transparent appearance, except for the band at the horizon, where more solid, opaque paint in both the land and the sky suggests solidity and focus. It is surprising that the amount of detail suggested there on the nearly flat horizon is sufficient to give the rest of the painting more substantial feeling, and together with a dramatic sky, hold the viewer's interest. That certainly held mine as I was doing a study, and I was really happy to do it. Um, you know, I, in fact, I had to. There was some weirdness in the photograph. Um, I just had to fill in some of the details. Um, and, and, and go for it. But you, you, just for you, don't, don't hesitate to do that sort of thing in your own work, you know. You don't need a huge, uh, hugely detailed reference. If anything, it can be a bit more of a detraction. And again, in the, the, uh, the membership area, you'll hear me as I'm painting this, you know, my inner struggle where I'm going, all right, this is good enough. It's good enough. I'm moving on. And it was. It was indeed. But um, you know, way, it takes me more time and more effort to do these studies after Ness than it say uh, it does for me to generate my own painting from a photograph or some other inspiration. Yeah, look how thinly I'm painting that, really thin, and that really uh, everything started coming together when I took that approach there. Okay, so let's, without much further ado, because I really want to get into this biographical. Um, now we're going to read from A History of American Tonalism, 1880-1920, by David A. Cleveland, who is just an excellent author. This is one of the best art books you could ever hope to get, and I never tire of promoting it, because it writes, uh, he writes like a poet, um, unlike so many um, art books out there. Okay, we're on page, we're picking up on page 46 here. The nests in Eagle's Wood in the search for a quality of tone. In 1863, Annette's relocated to an estate known as Eagle's Wood in New Jersey, 
which had a history as a utopian religious community. By the way, man, I'd love to see some rural New Jersey landscapes. Uh, I know um, one of the big supporters of the channel here lives in New Jersey, and that just looks beautiful there. Uh, I'd love to hang out on the East Coast and just paint away. That'd be awesome. Um, there he came again un under the influence of William Page, an artist whom he had first known in Rome in the early 1850s. Page not only directed Ines toward the Swede Swedenborgian faith, Ines was also baptized into the church in 1868, but encouraged the development in Ines of a harmonious and soft-edged tonal style that reflected or projected aspects of the Swedenborgian belief that material objects, their forms and colors, have spiritual significance and correspondence in a higher realm, the unseen in nature that Ines often referred to in his writings. The exuberance of the Medfield period is replaced by a quieter, softer paint handling, more rounded and sculptural. Now we're talking about around 1865 here. Um, um, this is a bit, bit of a writing about a specific painting, which I will skip. Uh, and that's this preoccupation with the quote-unquote middle tone, which by the late 1870s was becoming the distinctive element of his work. The middle tone, that's what defines tonalism. You're working with that middle, um, and you avoid a lot of extremes. And this painting is a perfect example. Even that really bright area in the center of the clouds is nowhere near. 100% white and none of none of the darkness in the bottom is anywhere close to 100% black yeah it's all middle folks tonalism's all about the middle you could just call it the middle school if you wanted ha 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 anyway now uh <clears throat> the middle tone was Page's idea. He claimed that the horizon should be a middle tone. That is, it should be halfway between the lightest light and greatest dark in the picture. Father agreed with him then on that point, but what they could not agree on... Oh, he's talking about Ines. Ines agreed with him on that point, but what they could not agree upon was just what a middle tone really was. So Page, to explain more fully, took a strip of tin and painted it white at one end and black at the other, and then graded in stripes from both ends until it reached a gray tone in the middle. This he showed to my father and said triumphantly, here is the true middle tone. The next day, George and S went to Page's studio with a similar strip of tin and declared that he had the true middle tone. When they compared the two hues, there was no resemblance between them. Then the fight was on, and these two gentlemen, after yelling themselves hoarse and saying some very uncomplimentary things to each other, would break away and not speak to each other for many days. Then they would come together again and resume the argument with renewed vigor. Well, I think we'll leave it there because we have enough time to wrap things up. Yeah. Hey, this was fun to do. And, you know, another little beautiful painting. Um, I, I, who knows? I, I will have this for sale in my store. Um, you know, if you've got any dosh, if you've got some extra dosh, go ahead and purchase it. Yeah. Um, I think I'll have that, uh, oh, probably two ninety nine or something like that. Don't quote me, though. Look at the price in the store. Um, but that sounds fair. I think that's, I'll commit to that. Um, and that includes free shipping, free international shipping, which ain't cheap these days, folks. Um, and uh, your satisfaction, of course, is guaranteed. There's a lot of ways to support this channel, by the way. Um, Join the members area. There's a donation button. It's a thank you button underneath the video. If you feel like real magnanimous, you can click on that and send me some some dosh. Uh, I have a donation page on my personal website. Um, and anything you can do to support my project. You know, uh, it's not easy uh, for artists uh, these days. Not complaining. I know we all have our own problems and challenges in this current economic climate. Um, for my part, I'm determined to keep bringing you. Um, and that's studies and paintings after my own work and things like the recent cloud tutorial and things like that um, because I think it's important that we uh, we keep painting and that we don't uh, despair um, in this current economic uh, climate because um, the, the wonderful thing about painting is that it's not just about now it's about the future the paintings you create will um, survive you yeah now you see me turn the painting at a certain angle here that's just to get a little better photo and uh, yeah, it doesn't look as good right now. But anyway, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And uh, 
Yeah, if you made it this far in the video and that you're the type of person that's inclined to leave a comment, I, I love comments. That's another great way to support the channel. Just in that case, you're just making the artist feel like he's not talking to himself. <laughs> <laughs> which I, I, I am a lot of the time anyway. Anyway, until I come back with another video for your edification and enjoyment, do me a favor, do me a solid. Take good care of yourself, your family, all your loved ones. Be patient with people that have views that differ from your own. None of us know everything. Um, stay out of trouble, and God bless you and your family.